This is Swarfcast. I'm Noah Graff. I am very honored to be with George Conidaris, Associate Professor at Brown University, co-founder and chief roboticist at Real-Time Robotics. Welcome to the show, George. Thanks, Noah. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, this is perfect because everybody's talking about AI and I haven't heard anybody focus on robotics on the podcast I listen to. So this is an excellent opportunity. Plus, it's the most relevant thing, I think, to a lot of our listeners who have job shops and work in job shops, etc. So just to get started, I want to know just a brief overview of your company. Then I'm going to get a story from you. And then I, I want to really like break in, dig deep into what we're talking about. So yeah, first, what is real time? So, so, so real time robotics is a company founded around some technology that we developed uh, in part when I was a professor at, at Duke uh, with another professor there that does uh, real time robot motion planning. So, so what that means is that um, uh, we produce a sort of control box that you plug your robot into and uh, you, you, tell it where it should put its business end, but not the rest of it. And our system computes where everything else should move. Uh, and what's most exciting about that, and, and so when, I'm, when, when I say everything else, I mean, for example, all the other joints of the robot arm, um, like we will decide whether a robot's elbow, sh elbow should go and at what time, how its wrist should move and at what time, and you just tell us you know, where you need work done. Yeah, so, so, so real-time robotics, you know, we, we focus on robot motion planning. We focus on how a robot can automatically generate its own motion. So, so instead of uh, the current state of the art, which is that a human has to come in, typically a, a robot integrator, and program every aspect of a robot's motion in order to accomplish a, a repetitive task. And that means deciding where every joint of a robot arm should go, for example. Um, with our system, you can kind of tell the robot where it needs to put its business end. Like, this is where I would like you to weld, or I would like you to pick up the object over there, or I would like you to drop an object over there. And we compute the rest of the motion for you. So, so we build a, um, a runtime control system where you can command the robot at a much higher level. Uh, and uh, it has this sort of basic physical intelligence to determine how to move around in the world without hitting stuff uh, and to make its motions efficient. And what's most exciting about that is it frees the person uh, setting up the robot system from having to specify every last tiny iota of how the motion should take place. Uh, and it enables things like having multiple robots moving at the same time in the same workspace without hitting each other, just the way that robots do, you know, uh, sorry, just the way that humans do. Yeah. And humans are very physically fluent, right? We, we move through the world all the time. We never hit anything, uh, or at least not frequently. Um, we're able to move around other people. We're able to coordinate. Uh, and that's not actually present in most industrial robots at all. And, and we aim to fix that. Very interesting. It sounds almost like, and I bet you're getting over this all the time, like the chat GPT, you know, like, you want to write a composition and, you know, worrying about just getting the bones down of the composition and uh, spitting it out. You have a tool to get a lot of it done for you. But in a way, to me, this seems like way better. I mean, you get the finished job. It's not just uh, this is a decent draft and um, now you can fix it up. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one. I, I think the analogy is very apt. One way that I would think about the difference, though, is that you know, ChatGPT is like top down of intelligence to start with language, which is very high level and symbolic and abstract, and and fill in more language, which is also symbolic and abstract. But what's interesting about robots, and what's interesting specifically about robots and AI, is um, that's not yet where the challenges are. The challenges are much lower level, just mm -hmm. just through moving through space, just doing perception, just generating motion. And those are not abstract and symbolic. They're about the physicality of moving through the world. And so that's why we talk about it as, as a kind of foundational physical intelligence that needs to be present in robots that isn't today. You know, we've automated so much stuff, but we've automated it at great engineering uh, effort and expense because we've had to deal with the fact that robots are so physically stupid. Uh, and this is, about, uh, this is about just inserting that kind of first few levels of motor control um, to make them uh, just you know, physically comfortable in the world. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, so just to summarize, um, I have, for instance, 
you know, in our world, people will be running some CNC lathes or maybe something manual and they can't get the entire part done. And so they have to bring it from one machine to the next. And sometimes it can be awkward. They have to open the door and get it in there, et cetera. And so rather than somebody programming this direction and that direction, you can just say to the robot, I need you to take this piece, open the door, stick it in the door, put it right exactly there and get it done rather than, uh, you know, the mechanics of it all. Is is it capable of doing that? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, so, and so, so the analogy that I like to use, which I think is very applicable to machine tending and to, to lots of other cases is, you know, think about when you reach into your fridge to grab a beer, right? Um, uh, what most people who haven't worked with robots don't realize is that the vast majority of the ways that you could move your arm from, you know, next to your body to into the fridge to pick up the beer actually results in you crashing into the fridge or one of the shelves or another food item. It's actually it's actually quite a small, narrow uh, uh, path you have to go through in order to pick that beer up and extract it from the fridge. And mm-hmm. in and, you know, so you can imagine that's analogous to like reaching inside a machine where there's caging. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, the way that you would do that with a robot today is you would have to engineer the fridge so that everything is in roughly the same place uh, uh, or, or not even roughly the same place, almost exactly the same place. And then an engineer would, you know, either demonstrate to the robot how to move its joints or program literally how to move its joints and then test that thing repeatedly to make sure there's no collisions and then run it again repeatedly over and over again. But then of course, you know, when you and I go to our fridge, everything is moved around. At least my wife and daughter tend to move things around. And so, you know, it can't be the case that I rely on just just trajectory execution every time. It has what to about be the case like, that I... What about like the Roomba, like, you know, the robot vacuum? So that's basically like, um, rather, it, it can do it without things being rearranged, but yes, it basically totally. relies on bumping into things and that's how it learns. Well, the, the early models did that. Uh, later models can sense an obstacle. But the thing seems, about a Roomba seems is like that that's what mine does. I don't know. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, mine tends to bump into things. Yeah. Um, but but the the thing the thing to the, the way to think about that is that a, a Roomba can do motion planning. Once it knows where the obstacles are, it goes around them. Um, and but the reason it can do that is because a Roomba is basically a circle. Right? It's basically a circle mm-hmm. on a on a two D plane. And so we've known for a long time how to do you know, we call that special case path planning. We've known for a long time how to do path planning efficiently. But then when you get a six or a seven degree freedom arm and the joints of the arm are much more geometrically complex, uh-huh. and now you're doing a search in a six or seven degree uh, uh, um, space instead of a, you know, because it's actually perfectly circular, room is really in a 2D space, just X and Y. The angle doesn't so really it's matter. One, it's round. Well, so a Roomba would be two axis or one axis then? Two axis, um, like, so, well... Yeah, because you can rotate and you can go forward, right? So it's got two degrees. It's got two control degrees. Um, but uh, but when you're doing the collision checking, you really are just comparing a circle to to an obstacle. It's very easy to think about, you know, which motions crash into the environment and which don't. Whereas when you're thinking about, you know, if you can imagine like a six or seven degree freedom arm, the geometry is really complicated. So what you actually have to do is take that CAD model configure the CAD model so that the poses are all on a specific thing and then check that against another CAD model of the obstacles in the world or sensed obstacles in the world. And that's extremely expensive. And so that type of motion planning is what we couldn't do up until uh, we found it real time. That could not be done in in, in real time uh, before before our system. That's why they call it real time because you oh, yes. punch it in, it's, and you It not... just goes. So, okay, so... It's got to get, say it's got to get around the corner um, to get it into the machine. How, I mean, how does it know exactly where, where things are? It doesn't have like eyeballs on it to know, or just, it can sense. So there's two different ways. There's two different ways that we use to sort of describe the environment. Uh, One way is that you can upload a CAD model. So if you do have a fixed environment. Um, or you've got an environment with degrees of freedom you control, for example, like a door that you can programmatically open or close. You can upload that CAD model, and then the robot will will just know from the CAD model. And the other way is that you can attach cameras, so we call this rapid sense. Um, uh, typically, we use depth cameras, and typically, we use more than one. So you'll sort of surround 
the area with a couple cameras and they will build up a sense of where the obstacles are in the environment and where they aren't and it will, it will move around them. That sounds way more real time, like that's what it should be about, correct? Yes, yes, totally. It, it's, it's a weird artifact of robots being stupid that the vast majority of robot installations today are so highly engineered and so expensive to do very basic repetitive motions. Um, you know, if you, if you think about how hard it is to, to get a robot to effectively pick something up and put it down or, or do a basic welding motion or pick something out of a machine tended, uh, out of, out of a, a CNC machine and put it somewhere else, like that should be trivial, right? You can show a person that in 30 seconds and yeah. then they can reproduce that. And it's not because they're, you know, it's not because they're like super highly educated or amazingly talented at this. Any person, you can generally train very quickly to be able to do that. Um, and that's because the first couple of layers of your motor cortex just know how to do that, right? That's built into your brain. Yeah. And so one way to think about what we're doing at real time is we're providing those first couple of layers of the motor cortex. We're, we're building that basic physical intelligence in. Um, and, and then eventually that's going to widen the envelope of what can be automated. At the moment, only very repetitive, very restricted things can be automated at all, not just cost effectively, but at all. Um, even with your make... even with your technology, it still has to be a repetitive thing. Take this well, and well, put it somewhere else. Well, it's got to be relatively repetitive, right? Because it's a robot. But um, but but what our stuff will do is it'll widen that, so so you can have more process variation. You can have less structure. You don't need s such expensive uh, fittings to get everything to exactly the right spot. Um, in just the same way that you can introduce a human to a factory and say, pick up those widgets of that type and put them in that box. Keep doing that until the box is full, and then move on to the next box. So is you this done? Is this operated by? Uh, you know, it's it. You can just talk to it, and it'll no, do no, it. No, no, you've got a, you've got a. At the moment, you have to program it, and the majority of our installations are programmed using a PLC. Just that's because that's what our customers are used to using. Um, but what we've done is that the instructions for the PLC. You know, it used to be that you would have to set every robot's every joint in the robot to a specific value. And now instead you can send much higher level commands to the PLC, like uh, um, sense where an object is and go to that location, or or move the end effector to a specific weld point, and you just you just you don't talk about the rest of the robot. We handle all the rest of it. For so you. it takes less training to do it. Yes, uh, it takes less training and less effort. So we can reduce uh, PLC programs that are often hundreds hundreds of statements long to single digit statements in many cases, and you get out better efficiency and uh, and we make sure there's no collisions. You don't have to run what you've programmed and eyeball it and make sure it doesn't collide. It's built into the system that it never will. Very cool. And this can integrate with tons of different brands. It just sort of overrides yes. their control. Yeah. So, so we think of, we think of robot arms the way most people think of printers, which is, which is that they're all peripherals and our job is to provide drivers for those peripherals. And to you, they should look just the same because they have similar functionality. So you don't have to go learn the programming language associated with one robot brand. You just plug it in. We have a driver for that robot family. Right. And then you tell that robot where you want its end effector to be using our system, and we take it there. Right. I mean, so back can... in the day, you had to download the stupid driver for the new printer you had. and uh, yes. so but even, yeah. but even before that, you used to have to learn, you know, just having drivers was a, was a major advance, like in the late seventies before IBM PC came along, you know, you would have to hire a person to integrate a printer and a computer. And that person would have to know the special purpose programming language attached to that printer. That's where robotics is today. It's, I still think printers are assholes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if, printers are still terrible. Maybe if that's you not listen, a great it's funny. The last podcast <laughs> I did, I had a conversation with somebody about printers. They still, are like one of the main things that messes up. Yes, that's right. You know, it's well, out of, it's out of ink or it's out of or it just won't communicate right or it was paper jams like yes. it's still the problem. It's it's the same honestly it's the same sort of it's a smaller version of what makes robots hard. It's like when you're living only in the computer then everything is okay and as soon as you hit the real world then you run into physics and mechanical engineering and mechanical wear and stuff gets complicated. Uh, not that I think printer, printer companies have done a great job, but 
Um, <laughs> but uh, but that's sort of where the where the computing hits the hits the road, so to speak. Right? Uh, and that's always trouble. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay, so you know, um, a couple years ago, actually, I, it was the second podcast interview we did for the show. Um, five years ago was with Esben Ostergaard from Universal Robotics. And, and it was, he's, he's great. He's fascinating. It's an amazing company. Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, yeah, you guys would have a lot of mutual respect for one another. Uh, But to me, it seems like this might make the cobot a little bit, it might take the value away of it, uh, away from it a little bit. Am I, Am I right? Or I'm sure that's personal opinion, but. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, okay. So one way to think about cobots is that, is that they have two distinguishing features. One is that they're very easy for a person to program by like manipulating the robot. Uh, and that's totally compatible with what we do. Um, uh, and the other one is that cobots are safe to have around people. And mm-hmm. the way that, and, and one way to think about how that's been done is. Because they're light. Because they're light and they're weak and they're compliant. And, and by we come in, like, it's not going to knock your head off if it hits you, right? It's going to, uh, and that's one way to get around the problem of robots, not knowing how to move around the world without hitting things <laughs> is to make sure it's just to accept that they're going to hit some things, but they're not going to hit them too hard. It's all going to be fine. Um, and I think that we've sacrificed some stuff for that in industry, right? They're not as fast. They're not as precise. And so in, in many industries where you really need throughput, you can't apply a, co- a cobot because it just doesn't have the performance that you need. And so, you know, what we're hoping to do is to substitute a different technical solution to that. The robot is not going to hit stuff because it knows how to not hit stuff instead of it's going to hit stuff, but be gentle about it. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, I think there where there are applications where you really do need the throughput and the speed and the precision where cobots have people have tried to apply cobots but found them not quite technically able to do you know to meet those specifications they'll be able to do that with our system with the off the shelf industrial robot and also the um i guess cobots have the reputation that you know they're easier to program uh yes. you still have to integrate them which um i think people don't necessarily realize until they get them it really makes no sense to have a cobot uh, if you can actually have a robot that's really easy to do the right thing. Unless, you know, maybe it's a really sensitive environment and you're worried about, you know, something get getting hurt or maybe it's really light stuff or, you know, low volume. Yep. Or, or if you're having an integrator, instead of an integrator, you're having someone like at, at the factory or at the installation who isn't a professional roboticist and you're worried about their safety while they integrate the system, in which case it makes a ton of sense to have to have a cobot. Okay. Um, yeah, but, but, for, but in the long run, yeah. you know, we want robots because they're fast and reliable and precise. Um, and cobots have sacrificed some of that. So these robots, even with their intelligence and um, they still will require people to get a professional integrator. Yes, that's right. So, so, so you know, the way that I think about it is the integrator is doing a couple of things. One, they're sort of designing your work cell, you know, for a performance characteristic or to meet a specification. And that's a mechanical engineering skill that you, you know, that requires a skilled professional. There's no way around that. And another one is that they are taking, choosing components like the end of arm tool kit or the end of arm tool and, you know, the particular conveyor belt and the PLC and all the switches and they're, you know, integrating those into Worksell and writing the logic that controls them. And, you know, we don't do that. Um, but then the third thing that they often have to do is then they have to spend a lot of time hand designing that robot motion. And in particular, if there's multiple robots in the work cell, they need to try and coordinate the multi-robot motion ahead of time. so that And that's where the robots. real talent comes. And yeah, and that's where the real talent and the engineering effort. And often, you know, we've looked at use cases where it takes 13 weeks of engineering just to get the multi-robot coordination right. And, you know, we can drop it to one because in our case, that last part, you just plug the robots into the same box and they never hit each other. Incredible. They, you know, um, 
and and that's that's where I think it, our sort of first killer application is in multi robot deconfliction. Because how many robots can you guys uh, make work together at the same time, hand in hand? So we can do sixteen um, plugged into the same box, which is um, which is uh, as many as I could conceivably imagine you needing in one work cell. Um, yeah, and most of that that work would go to an automotive plant. Yes, that's right. Yeah, an automotive, you know, they have severe throughput constraints. And then you have, you can imagine something large like a car chassis that's got to be welded or, you know, have bolts inserted. And there's many of those. And so it makes sense to have that all being done in parallel by multiple robots. In many cases, the cost of a single robot isn't anywhere near the cost of extra uh, cycle time. So they're happy to pay to add extra robots. But, sure. But what's happened in the past is they've had so many so much trouble coordinating the robots you know they've had to include interlocks which are these kind of big big cubes in the space where only one robot is allowed to go in so that their robots don't go anywhere near each other um that they found that i think a typical statistic we saw is adding a single robot only drop only gets you an extra 25 percent of um throughput speed up Mm -hmm. as opposed to the 100 percent theoretical which no one ever gets right but uh, with our system you can see more like 75 percent, so you can get much more of the win that you get by the extra robot because they can pass pretty close to each other and they're kind of they're mutually oh. cognizant if that if that makes sense. Interesting. So are you saying that a regular integrator right now, even with all their talent, they'd only be able to do it to the point where it gave you twenty five percent better uh, throughput. Throughput or output? Or are they the same um, thing? Twenty five percent faster throughput. Okay. I have to get my units in the right direction. Yeah. Um, um, yes. And, and that, whereas that gets with a... this system, not only would it be faster, it could boost it 75% because it can do stuff that even a very skilled uh, integrator can't do. Yeah, that's right. Because because as you increase the number of robots, it gets combinatorially harder to think about where they're all going at the same time. Um, and also an integrator is building the system, but not seeing it at runtime. So they're building in it, it in advance, and so they have to be conservative, whereas our system is actually controlling the, the robots at runtime all the time. And so, you know, if there's a little bit of process variation, that's fine. We just handle it, whereas an integrator has to think ahead and try and try and put an envelope on the process variation and be because conservative. Because he's only going to come, happen. he's only going to become at the beginning, come, come before it. He's not going to be like living there, keep coming yeah. back to adjust it. So you're saying that because this can, you can, once it's set up, you can have a guy working at the factory adjusting it. Well, no, what actually happens is our controller adjusts it at runtime, like the actual, actual our software just makes sure that at runtime, everything is coordinated and also maximally efficient. And, you know, the way I think about it is amazing. The, what the integrators are doing, and they do a tremendous job, and I'm always in admiration of how, smart they are is you know they're, they're like choreographing a ballet where all the dancers are going to be blind and or or in the dark and they're going to run that whole thing ahead and they and they have to plan it all out and then they have to you know then they have to start it and then leave um and assume that none of the ballet dancers crash into each other um whereas you know what we're doing is we're as if you were there at runtime watching every ballet dancer and telling them what to do it's much much better and more efficient, and you can be much less conservative. Right. So do they have cameras on them then in this case? So, so in this case, actually, the robots report their own positions. So they stream their own joint positions uh, to our control box. And so we know where all of them are at every moment, and we know their velocity. So we don't actually have to, you don't necessarily need a camera for the multi-robot set. All, all the robots plug into the same box, and they and they transmit their positions to each other. I see. Because and what transmit- happens is they, they kind of reserve space ahead of time. Like one robot will say, I'm going to go there, and it transmits that to the box, and the box blocks out that space and says you can't. None of the other robots can go there until it's been freed back up. Okay. Whereas the standard way, <clears throat> the integrator puts it in, they come up with a nice program, so they're choreographed, uh, but they're not communicating with each other. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, sometimes there's a little bit of communication, like there's a state bit that gets set, but it's very coarse, like, okay, you know, um, the machine's empty or something is the communication that happens, but nothing like the fine grained detail of where the arm is. Fascinating. 
and uh, so that's on the the really high level, and then on the lower level, say <clears throat> somebody is a job shop, and they just have some pick and place stuff. This is a case now where maybe where you'd have to bring in an integrator before uh, just a you know a sharp engineer at the shop could probably set it up themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we have a we have a an interface tool called Rapid Plan Create where you can import your CAD model or or digitize your workspace and you can kind of label the places where stuff needs to happen and click a few buttons and it will generate uh, the stuff needed to run the robot at runtime. Wow. Just kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. We're really excited because I think it's going to change, you know, it's just a whole leveling up of the basic, basic physical capabilities of these robots. Um, not mechanically, but, but sort of at the software level. And it's really going to open up a whole bunch of things that you just couldn't do before cost effectively or at all. Um, you know, manufacturing is, is, is a way, you know, for, for all everyone's like automation is taking over everything. The, the potential that has been realized is a tiny fraction. Yes. Of what could be realized if robots were less stupid. <laughs> if they could just move around on their own without hitting each other. Um, it turns out that you could drastically expand. Uh, what can be effectively automated. What is, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, what are you dreaming about at night? I, you seem like the type of person that you've got, you've got a dream of, all right, this robot, wait, you know, wait till it happens. It's going to be, this is going to be yeah. amazing. So what are you thinking, uh, say one year, five year, 10 year down the line? I would, I would love it if we could, uh, if we could expand the set of things that robots could do. If we could automate the manufacturing of more stuff, um, if things that people bought every day in their lives would be cheaper and better, and maybe could be customized, maybe wouldn't have to be quite so identical because each robot running could be a little bit different, um, uh, and that would make everyone's lives better, and it would be uh, a lot more fun, I think. Um, I'm just really, you know, if you look at where robotic automation is today, the vast majority of robots are in very high volume, very um, uh, low variation settings. So like electronics or only portions actually of automotive manufacturing, like like on the order of 10% of your car is produced, uh, of the process of uh, producing a car is done by robots and the rest is done by hand okay. because we can't feasibly automate that thing yet. And, you know, this is... This is a case where we're producing a very high value object um, and we're producing thousands of them of the same type with very repetitive motions. And even then we can't automate more than 10% of it. And that's, that's just, that's unfortunate. Um, so we're going to fix that. Uh, and then, and then things can get less rigid and less structured. They can be lower batch sizes. They can be more, more variation in the object type or uh, shape. Uh, they don't have to have such high, cost inputs to building a factory that gets everything to do exactly the same place every time. So it gets much cheaper to do automation and much simpler to build factories. And maybe now we can build factories closer to where people use things. So we don't have to spend so much time and energy and, and environmental costs, moving them around. Uh, all these things will be kind of opened up by, by, you know, even, even a relatively small incremental advance in what can be automated. Cool. Okay. I want to know though, like, Five years from now, what are you picturing your dream robot doing? Well, so, so I actually, so as you mentioned in the beginning, I actually have two hats. So, so uh, I have an academic hat where I do research on sort of core AI questions. And I have an industrial hat where I, where I think about, you know, how do we make the robot do the thing in real life? And so for real time with my, my and that's real not person, normal. That's not always the case. You sometimes, often it's just the research versus the guy implementing or woman um so, so, sorry what do you mean the uh, so you're saying this is this is an interesting combination because often yes it's just somebody doing one of those things yes that's right yeah i'm i kind of i kind of bridge these two worlds a little bit which is occasionally awkward um but leads to leads to fun and interesting things to learn um so in the real life setting yeah i just i just love to see the set of things I, i'd love to see uh something like the fraction of an of a car that is done that is uh, produced by a robot goes from ten percent to twenty percent, 
Um, and, you know, I drive a Toyota Camry. Um, it was $16,000 new off the lot. And that is a miracle of uh, industrialization, right? It's really, it's it comes with a lifetime drivetrain warranty. It's just like a really reliable and high quality car. And, you know, just imagine if everything in our lives were that well engineered and that reliable and that cheap relative to the functionality that you get. I think that would be smashing. That may take more than five years. Um, uh, but but I think that's the sort of natural end point of where a lot of this automation work is going. Mm -hmm. Do Sorry. you do you picture, uh, I mean, now, you know, everybody's talking about the chat GPT and everything. Uh, yes. How do you, I guess, in your applications, do you imagine the robot talking back to you uh, as far as uh, and, and just saying, hey, I need this um, item put over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe even asking it your its opinion. Do you think you're going to need X setting to do that? Do you think you're going to need, uh, you know, what are you going to need to do that? Um, so, having a conversation is, do you see that as one day? Definitely one day, uh, you know, but maybe a full on conversation, I think is a little far away. Um, wh where I think I can imagine the chat GPT thing becoming useful in robotics relatively soon is, you know, very often we will, we will program a robot using a sort of formal language, like a PLC programming thing, or maybe like Python or in academic settings, we use something called PDDL, which is a high level language for describing tasks to a robot and the robot has to plan to figure them out. Mm -hmm. Um, and producing those formal programs is really painful. Uh, it's done by hand by an expert. It, PDDL is usually someone with a PhD in, in robot task level planning. Uh, and what we're finding now in academic research is that actually things like GPT are a very good translation layer. So, so not like directly to the robot, but from language to this kind of formal language like a program, not like a general purpose program, not like a Python program that you can run, although in some cases it can do that. But just like a declarative language, like, you know, um, I can say, hey, you should put at no more than 20 bolts into that box um, before you ship it off and get the next box. And that can actually be translated into something like a control program for a PLC. And that can do a little bit of a control. Now, of course, you have to get it exactly right. And it will be a few years till we're there. And you need to show the person what you think they meant to make sure that they meant the right thing. But yes, actually, in the next five years, I think we'll see cases where industrial and maybe even some home robots you can talk to, but it will. But ChatGPT will just be doing translation more than anything. It'll be translating from natural language to this well-understood formal kind of programming-like language. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. That's interesting. I, I heard, I heard on a podcast. Uh, <laughs> it's the guy. I can't remember his name. I believe he's an Indian guy. He was. He used to work at Google. And then he wrote a book about happiness and he's one of those kind of doomsdayers. Mm -hmm. uh, he said in five years, you know, we won't need to be human programmers because they're going to be able to program better than, than we are. They it's do you, in your knowledge. Do you think that's going to be the case? No, I, I, I really don't. I think, I think, let's say I would be extraordinarily surprised if that would be the case. I, I can see these things making us more productive. I can see them being sort of co-pilot style things. Um, but I don't see them doing the fundamentally creative, thoughtful work, you know, and, and this is one of the things like when you're programming, sometimes you're doing, you're really grappling with something or you're engaging or you're architecting the system or you're doing something creative. And sometimes you're just plugging all the wires like, well, this thing's got to connect to that thing and this thing to that thing. And here's my, here's my, um, uh, here's a little bit of kind of uh, scaffold code that I have to write that I always have to write the same stuff. And so I think that those models will be very helpful for speeding up the less creative, more scaffoldy parts. Okay. Um, but fundamentally, if you are writing a useful program, it is mostly new. And these models are pretty good at interpolation and um, between the data that they've seen, and they've seen the whole internet with the data, so that's a lot. But most fundamentally new things... I don't think they'll get, I think they'll get like 85% right, which is amazing, but, but not well enough that you aren't going to have to go back and fix it, which in many cases will take you longer than just writing from scratch anyway. You don't think one, one day they'll, I mean, 
maybe one day, but not five years, not not twenty five years actually. I would not twenty five years. No, no. Um, it's so it, interesting how everybody differs in what you know. Yes. How, what they think is gonna. Yes. Well, this is what happens with the, with the science in a state of flux. The way that AI is right is that you know if if you go to most people in most hard sciences and you ask the experts to make predictions, they will make fairly consistent predictions because there's a sort of conventional agreed how things are working and, and everyone is working towards the same goal and they have the same kind of mental structure in their heads about how this is going to happen. With AI, everything just kind of got blown up, right? Like the, uh, it's like we threw all the parts in the air and they fell into the ground and everyone sees a different picture and has a different idea of how it's going to come together and what it's going to mean. And it will take a few years for that to settle and for there to be it makes reasonable it fun instances. to talk about, though. It does make it fun to talk about. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit painful to be in the field because you you get into a lot of fights about um, uh, where you think the other person is being very unreasonable in either direction, and it's just because we're all look, you know, we're all trying to make sense of exactly what's happened in the last five years, which has been quite amazing. Actually, very interesting. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I would think. If I was in your field, that would make it extra fun because it is extra fun, but it but it's tiring to keep up with, and it's also a little bit okay. One of the problems, which which you know, this discussion is often highly technical, and between experts, it often makes sense, and then it will it will get picked up by like the mainstream media, like it'll get into the New York Times or the Washington Post, and then you know, and then what comes out is a highly compressed very, very summarized a discussion of a very technical topic. Uh, and then that gets fed back into this swirling conversation that can influence things like, you know, how much federal funding is available for AI or, you know, should, be re- should we be really worried about the end of the world? And then you're also dealing with this extra side conversation, which is really important, uh, but isn't always necessarily fully grounded in the technicalities of things or the, or the, or the, the technical details of things. And it can that can be a little exhausting dealing with every person I meet. I'm like, yeah, I'm an AI professor. You know, um, uh, there's a probability that we have to have a half an hour conversation about um, where I have to fix all the misconceptions that they that you know that uh, that CNN has placed in their brains. So, um, yeah. Well, sorry if I mean at least we've planned this conversation. So. Yes, yes, yes. No, and 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 you're you're technically sophisticated so it's a different type of thing it's, oh thank you it's uh it's really you know like people's grandparents that <laughs> um, well the story that always boggles my mind um and i'm you could probably tell it just as well as me i you know the story about the robot playing the go game <laughs> you know it's for for listeners who aren't familiar go is like the japanese chess but there's you know it's way it's it's exponentially more complicated and way more choices than chess and you know you can you can correct me if if i get the story wrong but there was a go tournament and it was an artificial artificial intelligent um computer that was in it and it gets to maybe it gets to the final and it's going against this world champion go player and it just makes a move that nobody has ever done like maybe in the history of go like uh, anybody who knew how to play Mm -hmm. and it dumbfounded the guy so much that that the quote-unquote expert champion he actually got up and came back 10 minutes later and uh because it it just flummoxed him and it was just incredible that in a way it was more intelligent than humans are because it didn't have our preconceived notions. That's right. Yeah. So, so the, so the go, the go program you're talking about is probably alpha go and alpha go learned go by playing go with itself. Um, which is, which is one of the ways that we build game playing programs because you, you need two players. So you spawn different copies of the program and they, play each other and they see, you know, what does better. Um, and actually there's a long history of that. There was a system, I think in 1992 or 1994 playing backgammon that, that I, so, so I don't know if you know this, but very serious game players rely on like a body of literature. So, so I was a moderately serious chess player in high school and 
there's a body of literature about chess that you have to learn in order to become a serious chess player. There's okay. like opening theory and there's end game theory. And this is built up over many generations. That's why today's chess players are much better than chess players 100 years ago, because they have this body of theory to play on. Interesting. But, and in the one hand, the body of theory is a boost because it, it, it lets you not have to relearn all these things from scratch, which you can't do in a lifetime. But in another sense, it's a bias. It, it, it channels you down one way of doing things. Um, and what we've seen with these automated systems is that, that they often pre reproduce the theory because the theory was correct or make, or make sense, but they'll do it on their own. But sometimes they'll break out of a specific aspect of the bias. Um, and uh, uh, what happened with backgammon, and this was a while ago before the current deep net wave, um, was that it changed. It basically rewrote one of the chapters in the opening textbook because it moved in a different way. And then you and then you could examine its reasoning. And several uh, backgammon grandmasters asked to see the reasoning and looked over it over and over again and decided it was right. And so they went and they rewrote their um, backgammon textbook to change the way, you know, to change this piece of... And so new of, textbooks for chess and all that, the, and all they're that being... are starting to happen, yeah. Um, so professional chess players uh, now study with a... Um, they call it an engine, but it's a chess playing program. They, When they're evaluating games, they have an engine running on a computer that points variations out to them and stuff. It's like an augmentation, which is which is really interesting, right? Bec and, it, and it breaks them out of this bias that... We all read the same textbook, so we all think the same thing. Uh, but these systems can get you out of that. Right, but, but now but, we're but, now we're reading that textbook. And... Yes, that's right. Yeah, but but you know you should think of a book as accumulated human knowledge, and you can get it any any which way as long as it's good. Um, and so most of these books are now the combinations of things that people have discovered plus some things that machines have discovered, and that's that's wonderful. Um, one thing I want to point out though is that people often make. A mistake, you know, Go is a thing, approximately speaking, you have to be pretty smart to be good at Go. It's very hard. <laughs> I'm not I'm not good. I, I tried in my 20s and I got sort of okay, but never really good. Um, and therefore, when people see a computer playing Go extremely well, they say, well, that computer, you know, human has to be really smart to play Go extremely well. Therefore, that computer is very smart because it plays Go extremely well. But this is a but this is a misconception of how narrow that machine is. Um, so, so that machine is extremely good at playing Go, but it can't make you a cup of coffee. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not broad. And one of the things that's interesting about human intelligence is that it is broad. Humans can do a very, very wide range of things adequately. Right? They, um, it's not that they're amazing at any one thing. Like n minus one people on the planet aren't the best Go player on the planet, but we still think they're intelligent, and that's because. Uh, you know, you can teach them to do more or less anything fairly quickly, and they'll do a reasonable job at it, right? And that's the fundamental nature of intelligence that we're trying to understand. It's not how do you get amazing at one thing. It's how do you get pretty good at almost anything. And, you know, amazing at one thing isn't really intelligence, right? Like a like your dishwashing machine's amazing. It dishwashes much better than me at dishwashing. Um, and a car is much better at locomotion than, you know, you say in bolts, right? Um so you can always build a machine that's better than you at one thing. Yeah. But the nature of intelligence is such that it's about as good at you as everything. And that's like a fundamental shift in, in the right way to think about intelligence that I don't think is caught on outside of academia yet. Right. Now that, right, you're saying, you know, it's still like very specialized. One thing is good at one thing. And yeah. And it might, it might not be that the techniques you use to get extreme, to beat the world champion at any one specific thing those techniques might not generalize to being adequately good at everything. It might, it might be a completely different family of techniques. That's true. Um, but it, it reminds me of, yeah, go on. It's just going you know, to say, you know, the techniques you use to build a dishwasher are very different from those you used to build a high performance car, like a Ferrari. Um, and, and that's what happens when you're optimizing for one thing is you build this tool set and this, this set of set of things that are really narrow, um, but amazing. Right. And well, one of the things that's cool about humans is that they can do that. Only some, you know, only some of them do it very well, but uh, but you can teach the same human to repair a dishwasher as you can teach to drive a car. Right? That's which is amazing. So uh, Well, you got me. I mean, since we're going philosophical here, uh, <laughs> have you ever heard of a book called Range or a book called The Sports Gene? I have um, not, no, I'm afraid. There's a guy God, I'm trying to remember what his name was. 
great author. He he. There's a book called The Sports Gene in which he studied how, um, for instance, you know, people who are uh, an Olympic take the Jamaican bobsled team. Mm-hmm. They were they had a talent with track, and they were able to use their talent to do another sport. And because they had that specific background, in a way, they were able to do that other sport better and in a Mm -hmm. different way than the people who just specialized in that one thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, so sports, sports in particular are are really interesting. Um, But they say that he wrote another book about the jobs, you know, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if you're uh, a lawyer, it may have benefits when, if you were to become a business person. Yeah, that's right. So, so we so we often call this transfer. We say that some of the skills that you learn in one task transfer to another task, uh, and sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's direct, right? Like, um, you know, being able being very fluent with argument is really good for being a lawyer and also helpful for pitching a business, right? Um, and sometimes it's subtle, like, well, there's some specific aspect of your muscles that make you good at bobsleigh and also um, and also uh, running. But there's actually also negative transfer. So, so Go is a good example um, where, you know, I was a relatively serious chess player in high school, but I never got good at Go. And actually, that's a well-known phenomenon that if you, if you first get good at chess, you are unlikely to be able to get good at Go because, because the tool sets are like, are like in conflict. What if they're, you were good at Go? Would it be easier to go down to chess? Yeah, so some people think so, um, but I think the difference is chess is primarily tactical. I mean, you can be strategic about it, but it's but it's fundamentally tactical. Whereas Go is the tactics are actually pretty not very complicated. It's 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 overwhelmingly strategic, and so the balance of how you think about things is very different. Um, so 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 you can get negative transfer too, right? You can get the person trained in one way um, uh, isn't isn't great at doing things the other way. For example, I think computer scientists, once you've been had enough computer science training, you're probably unable to succeed in the humanities because you, um, you, you're you unable to, you know, you want everything to be precise and well-defined and clear, and you have a lot of right. trouble dealing with ambiguity or um, or or uh, imprecise or fuzzy, fuzzily defined terms, right? It drives you nuts because you, you, know, you want to be able to program the thing. And so, Humans are really interesting. Right? Our brains are fascinating things that are able to do all this stuff, but also the experience of learning something actually changes you profoundly. Um, let's just let's just do talk about a few other things because you, I mean, you, here's the thing I've always been wanting, um, and my brother-in-law works for Waymo, and I, I ought to be trying. They, you know, for people that don't know, they're a self-driving car uh, like division of google um thing i hate the the gps in the car i i think they're terrible Mm. uh they take you into construction zones they take you into horrible neighborhoods Mm -hmm. i was i was talking with him last summer it was like you know when we have the the self-driving car is it going to be able to like know about certain areas like maybe you don't want to take you know there's a lot of crime and He's like, no, I don't think they'll, they'll, you know, could be considered racist, for instance, if, if it kept you out of a certain area. So my thing is, I want to be able to talk to my car while I'm driving and have him say, or her say, you know, make a right and go on Ashland Avenue in Chicago, and me say, well, you know, there's a parade going on over there, or there's you know, I go there all the time. Do you have a different idea? What, you know, do you see that, that conversation uh, happening anytime soon? And I mean, because I, I would see that make sense with a robot, you know, mm-hmm. if, yep. if you're, if you're in a shop, and the robot is really doing more complicated things, you, it would be nice to be able to like, talk back to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so here's interesting to differentiate between a robot and a, and a sort of more narrow system, right? So what's interesting about a robot is 
uh, a robot in principle is capable, you know, one with rich sensors and rich actuators in principle is capable of, of, of perceiving the same stuff about the world that you and I perceive. So we have like a common shared reality that we can access. And, but that's not true of something like Google Maps, right? So Google Maps, the reason why it can't, you know, send you around an area where there's construction necessary is just because it doesn't have that data. That's like not in its data universe. Right. Mm. So like an undesirable area or an area where, you know, there's likely to be flooding unless someone has specifically chosen to import that kind of data and then go gather it. Uh, it's just not in the in the set of things it can use for decision making. Um, so actually, I think that's why. You know, Google sent a dude around in a car to like, yeah. you know, video the whole planet. Right. But you can't do that every day. And what you can get is you can get data from people's cell phones. You can get satellite data. But, but getting data on the ground with softer, more complex labels that you can apply consistently everywhere is much harder for a narrow That's why system. it makes sense if you can work together. Because you yes, can... that's right. Yeah, but, but, but then if you say something like, oh, uh, let's say I don't like going through this area because the roads are bad. Um, you might be able to say, I don't like going through this area. But it's much harder to say, like, what does it mean to the system to say the roads are bad? Does it have... That, you know, has someone gone and engineered into Google Maps that it should think about the quality of the roads and and does it have memory of that type of thing and how does it measure that and how do you represent that data? It's very hard in a narrow system that's trying to do one thing well to mm. keep adding these things. Whereas in a general, generally intelligent system, it's kind of open, to, you know, to receiving input from anywhere. And so you can point and say, that's what a bad road looks like. It's got potholes in it. Don't don't take me there. It's bad for my tires. Uh, and because you can, you, because you have the same sort of sensory motor interaction with the world, uh, that would make sense, but 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 you know, for something like a GPS, it just doesn't have that sensory mode interaction. It's just, you know, maybe one day when we all have cars which have a bunch of sensors on them, uh, it might, but but not at the moment. At the moment, the set of data they've got is very narrow. It's really like how many people are on this road, how long did it take, and where are the roads, roughly speaking. Interesting. Does that make, does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but do you see your do you see that as a place for your robot technology that in a couple of years we're we're going to have a conversation with it about how something should be done. You know, uh, not super soon for real time. Um, for my academic robot stuff, yeah, eventually you'll be able to have conversations. But that's, you know, that's what we call a research project, right? It's like a, it's it's kind of getting it working in the lab. That could happen in the next five years, but it's much longer to get it from the lab to actually uh, robust enough to give to a person driving a car in real life. Like that's not a that technology transfer is not a short pipeline, right? Um, so uh, yes, one day in my lab, you'll be able to have a conversation with the robot and and relatively soon, actually, maybe the next five years, in, in a relatively um, unstructured, open-ended way, and most of it will make sense. Um, uh, probably at least a decade before that, after that happens, before it appears in your house. Does that make well, sense? Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh... I uh, look. I, I think you have a. I would trust your educated guess over most people. I, I you know, I mentioned this in our in our prep. The whole Bill Gates things that take yeah, things right. that people say will take three years, take ten, and things that people say will take ten, take three. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's have a little fun here. Uh, what are your favorite uh, robot uh, or AI? movies i like a few things that come to my mind maybe uh, we're talking about games i'm thinking war games i'm thinking terminator short circuit her uh what what loved, what, what, what do loved, you like i loved sneakers this was a very long time ago in the 80s and i was a kid but i thought sneakers was great it doesn't have a robot with, in it but it's got with river phoenix hacking, hacking in it uh robert redford i think was the um and and it was it was yeah, it was just, it, you know, have you seen the late 90s movie Hackers? Which yeah, is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, which, where the idea is I that love, everyone I love the part of the movie where, like, they're hacking, they're sitting at their computer, and then all these numbers and stuff are coming yes. down the screen. Yes, and, and they're all dressed in, like, really tight clothing, and, the, and they list the techno all the time, um, which is, and, and also they're all unreasonably attractive. <laughs> I, I think, think Angel, what, is that Angelina uh, Jolie? And, yes, she, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and Johnny Miller were the two leads. Uh, so I think that's what Hollywood likes to think that hacking looked like. But sneakers is what hacking actually looked like, which is um, which is a lot of social engineering uh, 
and and a little more prosaic, but more fun, I think. So I always like that. And then in terms of robots, I, I love the robot from um, I loved uh, from Short Circuit, Johnny Five. Uh, George, thought, Short Short Circuit's Five awesome. Script. It's awesome. Yeah, it's got a kind of unfortunate. I think the villain is kind of um, not appropriate anymore. But uh, but the movie was great. Yeah, who was the I, who was the, the villain? Um, I'm trying to remember. You have but a better memory a, of it than me. There was it was what's his name Fish or something. He was also the villain in Hackers, um, <laughs> but uh, but in in Short Circuit, if I remember right, he was basically they put like dark makeup on him and and pretended he was Indian, which you you could not do that. <laughs> yeah, but in, in Short probably, Circuit, wasn't the good guy Indian as well? Steve Gutenberg's um, friend. He might have been, yeah. So but, then it's okay. Still you should, uh, I guess so, but, yeah, but still, this this kind of fake skin tone thing is not so great. But I love the robot. I thought the robot was great, and, and you know. Um, what about Terminator? How do you feel about that movie? <laughs> okay, I snuck into that movie. It was in South Africa. You had to be sixteen to watch it, and I saw it was fifteen. So I, it was the, I think it was the summer of ninety four or ninety five that I saw it, and I didn't know it, but I was watching. No, that's Terminator the, Two. Terminator Two. You... Sorry, yeah, Terminator Two. Yeah, so Terminator Two was was where we lost. We lost the public relations battle. So in the summer of 94 or 95, robotics lost the public relations battle for all time <laughs> with that movie. Um, that was going to come up ever, forever and ever. That movie was going to come up every time someone talked about robots. I love Terminator 1. I thought it was a great science fiction movie. And Terminator 2 was a great action movie, but I much prefer science fiction movies. So I'm a so, much bigger fan of the atmosphere, especially in Terminator 1. Was, was, Terminator 1 yeah. is awesome. It's much darker and it's more of a, it's almost like a B movie. That, yes, but I, I sort of liken it almost to like Godfather. Like I think the second one may be even better than the first one. But you, you're more of a, a Terminator One guy. Yeah, because the second one was sci-fi. It was almost cyberpunk, right? It, like it really. Um, I know, like that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger comes back as a good guy in the second one, though. Yes, yes, that is cool. Um, but the second one was, you know, big CGI chases and trucks in canals and. Uh, and the first one was like, you know, the, the club that they went to was called Tech Noir, which I just thought was really cool. Um, so so I'm, I'm a bigger fan of the first one. Than the How second, old but are I, you? I love them both. I'm, oh gosh, what year is it? It's 2020. I'm 43. You're 43? Uh, yes. I'm 43. God, you oh, seem right. like way older and smarter than me. All right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take the first one. Not, maybe not smarter as a necessarily. As well, no, <laughs> I mean, you just feel... I mean, you are, you're from South Africa. You're a, you're, you're very well-rounded, you know, lived in different yeah, places I'm, and. I'm pretty nerdy. Also, I'm wearing a formal shirt, which is what I do to project authority to my undergraduates. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Um, that's, that's impressive. I figured you were, you know, just from your body of work, I figured that you might, not that you look old, but. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I found myself in the ridiculously fortunate position of being able to, to you know, to nerd out for a living, um, and uh, and all day and all night I get to I get to think about robots and write code and do math and um, and I have a lab of ridiculously talented students who do most of the work actually. So, okay. academia is amazing in that way. It's it's really a lovely thing. And then and then with real time, it's also been a, an incredible education in how smart people are I, I love the engineers we have are so talented and can do things I could have never done and and how if you put this group of people together they can do they can they can change the world right it's really how do you like uh, being um you know this is a whole nother conversation and I, I don't know how much time you have but uh you know one is the research and it's almost the it's it's more than theoretical but um, but it's blue sky, right? Like, like I work on stuff that's only going to be useful at at the absolute minimum ten to fifteen years from now, right? I'm trying to look very far ahead, right? Uh, and then the other one is like, like let's make something that people are actually going to be using. Yes, yes. What what excites you more? I'm sure both of them excite you. Yeah, both of them excite me for different for different ways, right? I mean, uh, what I like about academic research is I can. You know, I'm chasing a scientific question like what is intelligence and how, how do you build it? And I like being able to do that essentially without a boss, right? Like, I, you know, I have tenure now. So um, <laughs> I think I've probably got another 25 years in the job and I can just choose how to use that to, to, to just, you know, um, make 
scientific progress as fast uh, as I can and take bets, right? You can take a bet when you have a 25 year horizon, you can say, oh, I think that in the long run, it's only going to work this way. Even if it might take 10 years to get there, I'm just going to do that, which, which I really enjoy. That's, and that's what's unique and special about academia. And I, um, so I love that. And then, and then with real time, you know, we've just been the, the gap between what in academia we imagine or what's the big questions facing robots are and the questions that, that will get, you know, make a difference in people's lives and actually deliver value is, uh, it's, I appreciate, really appreciate that I get to work on both. It's, uh, um, it's challenging and I've learned a lot and everyone has been very patient while I've learned a lot. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of wild. Well, I could just, I mean, they both have tremendous purpose and effect for the long term, but, uh, you know, I, for instance, as somebody who has a podcast and like knowing people are actually listening to it, granted, you know, I, I, I wish there was even more, but you know, if you're writing a research paper, it's right. It's just mostly your peers that are going to know about it. Right. That's right. It's a much smaller audience. So, 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 but what you accept in, in, in academia is that you are talking to a much smaller audience, but you're talking to a very technically sophisticated audience, right? So we can have very deep, it, academia is really just one long, deep technical conversation. Um, <laughs> right, like that, that's what these papers are, right? They're, they're just a way to have this conversation in a distributed, time asynchronous way. Um, and, and what you accept is that you accept that you will have, if things go well, you will have a profound impact on how the technology unfolds, but you're quite far removed from actually seeing it happen, right? So, so I'll write a paper, someone else will write a paper, will, several papers will be written and then over time, this collection of literature, which might be written by many people, like even up to 100 over time, will coalesce into something that someone puts into like a grade level textbook, which gets you know read by 10 times as many people. And then over time, that technology will kind of solidify and eventually will progress into something that's maybe in an undergrad textbook, which might be read by thousands of people. Yeah. And, then, and then when that becomes like well known enough and clean enough and, and uh, congeals into a kind of really crisp well-defined thing, then it gets turned into technology that people use. So, so a good example, my PhD advisor, Andy Barto, was one of the co-inventors of um, this field called reinforcement learning, which you may have heard about. It's a, it was the technology used to train the Go learning agent. Okay. Um, uh, and to do some of the learning in ChatGPT was done by reinforcement learning. And, you know, him and his first PhD student basically founded the field. And it was a four or five decade long Thing to build all the basic ideas in the field, build a community around it, write the textbook, get everyone excited. And now we're starting to see this, you know, really have a huge impact in practice. But, you know, they're very far down that pipeline. They're, they're, they're at the beginning with the base math and the algorithms and just the conceptualization of how you should do learning this way. And there's a lot of people between and a lot of time between them and someone deploying this on a robot in real life or on a a trading system on Wall Street or, you know, to optimize a nuclear reactor. Um, uh, but these things are happening. They're just happening like wave. They're, they're very distant from, from you know, someone in their academic office. But on the other hand, the influence you have is profound. And ideally, if it works out, it doesn't work. Very frequently, it doesn't work out. But, um, but you know, they, they created some piece of technology that is completely new in the world, right? But you're creating new technology as well in your own R&D department that can, yes, you know, yes, get pushed out could... to, so to me, yeah. that that's more, I guess that would be more instant gratification or maybe, it, but maybe it isn't uh, any more gratifying than, uh, it, it scratches a different itch for me. Um, uh, I, it, it makes me happy to see the actual technology on the ground changing, um, uh, and and the world's changing directly. That's very gratifying. On the other hand, I want to have a profound scientific impact, and that's also that's quite distant too. You can't um, you can't do um, just as powerful uh, scientific research in the private sector. You can, but the places that you're doing it are you are research labs, not. You know, you can do it when you are attached to a research lab, attached to a company that is so wealthy 
that it's basically like a federal government. <laughs> so you can do it at a Google research lab or a Microsoft research lab, but you or, can't. Or, or Pfizer. Right, yeah. Um, but the, the pipeline, basic research is so risky and has such a low probability of turning into a product in the next decade uh. that, um, that it's not feasible for most companies to sponsor it. Now, if you're as big as Google, you're effectively a federal government, so you sh- you can sponsor <laughs> it. Um, or if you're the federal government, you know that the competitiveness of your nation depends on it in the long run, even though it's very expensive, and so you socialize that cost, right? That's what the NSF does. It says, we accept that only one out of X number of 100 research projects will turn into something, but like, what's the value of having funded the internet? Like, how much does it matter to America that the internet was developed here, not in Europe or in China? And it a lot, right? And so, and so, countries are able to make that cost-benefit trade-off and have that long a horizon. Um, uh, you know, my advisors' reinforcement learning stuff originated in a federal grant from the, I think it was the Air Force in 1978, right? So, you know, uh, a company cannot start research in 1978 that gets commercialized in 2015. That's not, that's not, it's not on their timescales. You know, many big right. companies don't even last that long, right? Um, you know, so like Google hasn't has been existed only half that time. So, yeah. but the federal government has a much longer time span, and therefore it sponsors basic scientific research, and and that's why it often happens at universities. I'm, I want to, yeah, uh, I want to circle back a little bit to the original topic, um, yes. just skipping around, and and then. Uh, just a couple other questions I like to ask. I think, um, I don't know how much you know about the supply chain, but do you feel like these robots might enable um, more domestic manufacturing? You know, and I, this is a huge thing everybody's talking about. We're relying mm-hmm. too much on other countries uh you know it seemed like a great idea because then we'll have great diplomacy but at the same time like if all your weapons are or drugs are coming from another country you can't that's not a good idea so Mm -hmm. to me it seems like if this could make the labor cost go down and maybe the just some of the you know the the pain in the yeah. butt stuff it could do do you have you have you guys discussed this a lot so so not so much at real time because we're you know we're focused on on making the product happen uh and you know which is happening now and making you know we're focused on the nuts and bolts of commercialization but i think in the long run that's right i think i think one of the things that automation will do is it will change the sort of labor cost equation um at the moment like if you look at lots of manufactured goods you, you take the raw material from somewhere ship it across the oceans to manufacture it in one place and then ship right. it back across the ocean to deliver it to another place. I guess the and raw materials aspect is still going to be there. Still going to be there, right? Yeah. But, you know, wouldn't it be great if um, uh, if the cars used, sold in New York City were made just outside New York City, right? I mean, there, there's still some there's still some price to the, uh, to the, you know, square footage rent, which in New York City is probably extreme. But... Um, probably going down now. But. Yes, right. <laughs> But but uh, a lot of the other diff- cost differentials will be will be taken away by robots because they cost roughly the same to run everywhere, right? I mean, there's a there's a power thing, but the power is not actually that scary. And then it'll actually shift a lot of the cost burden to transport, which you will want to minimize by manufacturing things closer to there, uh, you, to where you sell them, which will be better for the planet and you know all that stuff. Do you plan to sell to countries all over the world? Yeah. So, so, you know, our, our, yeah, our processes will, you know, they, uh, at, at the moment, our main, uh, target is automotive. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we're selling to all the places that want to make and, cars. And is your technology patented? Yes. Yes. We have, we have a, because it was, because it's fundamentally new technology, right? It's not like a good implementation of stuff that existed. It was, it was new technology dreamt up while I was at Duke with another professor there and, and two student collaborators. So there, we've got like a very large patent portfolio that covers it. Uh, um, and, you know, additionally, we ship a box and the box is, uh, has, uh, has the implementation on it and that's encrypted and all that sort of stuff. 
is there anything else you'd like to say to the people of the world before we wrap this up? Um, I think that's mostly it. I think um, I just, you know, I know most of your listeners are technologists and I have a great admiration for what you all do and, and how it makes the world better uh, and how, you know, hard it is when you, when you hit real life. Um, and, uh, and I promise to do my best to make your lives easier soon so we can do more cool stuff together. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. This was so cool. Thank you. It was great, great pleasure to meet you. And thank you for the uh, opportunity to chat. 